Hey, welcome back, everyone. My name's Kagan. Today, we're going to talk about something that's a very important holiday to me, the 4th of July, American Independence Day, the most important holiday in the world, in the history of the world, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I don't care if you agree or not. That's the most important holiday of the world, the 4th of July, American Independence. On July 4th of 1776, at the Pennsylvania State House, located at 520 Chestnut Street in Philadelphia, the Continental Congress officially signed and adopted the Declaration of Independence, declaring the United States of America's independence from Great Britain and from King George III. Let's get into it a little bit deeper, though. So the American Revolution began on April 19th of 1775, exactly 442 days before the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Now, during April of 1775, the first battles of the American Revolution at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts took place. It also marked a significant ideological shift in the conflict where instead of peaceful protest, the colonists waged open war against the occupying British government. Ultimately, many people believe this is what eventually led to France getting involved in supporting the colonists, potentially to get one over on Great Britain and possibly as a retaliatory thing for their loss that they took at the French and Indian War. The first significant American opposition to British policy emerged after March 22nd of 1765 when the British Parliament passed the Stamp Act, which was essentially passed by Parliament in an effort to refill their coin purse after they blew tons of cash on the Seven Years' War and the French and Indian War with France. This act required that the colonists were to pay taxes on every page of printed paper that they used. It also included taxes on playing cards, newspapers, and dice. This is where the colonists came up with the slogan, No Taxation Without representation. Basically, the colonists were like, hey, look, we don't have any representation over there in parliament, so why should we pay your taxes? We don't get to make any decisions with how our lives are dictated over here. This is likely why the Sons of Liberty was formed in early 1765 in Boston, because the colonists were concerned about more taxes and more control being exerted on them from the British government. Later in that year, in the summertime, the colony of Massachusetts arranged a meeting of all the colonies to be held in New York that October, and they referred to it as a Stamp Act Congress. They also began to coordinate protests across the colonies against the Stamp Act. In August of 1765, the Sons of Liberty formed a mass of protest in Boston near what was referred to as the Liberty Tree near Boston Common, and they tied an effigy of Andrew Oliver to the tree. Now, Andrew Oliver was the city's stamp tax agent. He was the tax man who was actually like in charge of collecting those taxes. A few thousand people ended up attacking Andrew Oliver's office and his personal home, and they burned, desecrated, and destroyed his effigy in protest. Now, I'm sure that a lot of you have seen this kind of thing happening in recent years with presidents, people in Congress, whether it's here or abroad. I'm sure that you've probably seen it in other places too, right? Yeah, when people get angry, they'll make a voodoo to all of you and light it on fire sometimes. So most colonists began calling for boycott of British goods after this, and for the following months, there were even follow-on protests and organized attacks on other tax offices and homes of other tax collectors throughout the colonies. Eventually, Parliament voted to repeal the Stamp Act in March of 1766. However, they ended up issuing what was referred to as a declaratory act at the same time, which basically they were saying they had the authority to pass whatever legislation they want, dictating to the colonies what they were going to do and what they could and couldn't do. And they're just basically like, no, nah, we're still in charge. We're the boss and you're going to do what we tell you and you're going to pay taxes when we tell you to pay taxes. Now, surely some other things had to have happened other than just the Stamp Act to cause a full-on revolt and a revolution, right? Well, let's talk a little further on that. To be clear, the majority of the colonists continued to obediently accept British rule of Parliament, while a minority continued to openly protest some of the authoritarian measures that were being passed by Britain. That is until the Boston Massacre. In early 1770, over 2,000 British soldiers were occupying the city of Boston, which held around 16,000 colonists at the time. The purpose of this garrison of troops in Boston was to ensure order was held while the British government attempted to enforce their tax laws on the colonists, like the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts. Now, I know I talked about the Stamp Act. I didn't really get to talk about the Townsend Acts very much, but I'm going to get into it a little bit, explain what that is before we continue with the, the Boston Massacre. So the Townsend Act was actually named after a guy named Charles. Charles Townsend. Now, Charles Townsend was a British Chancellor of the Ex 
Exchequer. Not sure what that means. Google it. Chancellor of the Exchequer. Basically, the Townsend Acts imposed taxes on tons of imported goods like glass, lead, paper, paint, British China, tea, and a lot of other different British goods that were imported to the American colonies. In any case, the colonies were openly protesting the taxes being levied against them, and there were plenty of aggressive confrontations. Eventually, on February 22nd of 1770, an angry mob of colonists attacked a man's store because he was known for being a British sympathizer or what they referred to as a loyalist, right? So somebody who is loyal to the British government. There was a lot of aggression back and forth between people that were called or considered loyalists and people that were more pro-colonist, right? At the time, that's probably how they felt about it. His name was Ebenezer Richardson, and he actually lived near his store. And in an effort to break up the crowd that was attacking his store, he fired a gun through the window of his home into the crowd, killing an 11-year-old boy by the name of Christopher Cedar. Naturally, this only increased the level of contempt that the colonists had towards the loyalists and towards the British. Because when you do something like that, it's gonna piss people off. After a few days later, a brawl broke out in the street between a group of local colonists and British soldiers, which also continued to raise tensions. On March 5th of that year, there was a lone private by the name of Hugh White who was standing post the Customs House on King Street to keep people from stealing money that was being stored there. Just imagine you're a private by yourself guarding a whole bunch of money. That was Private Hugh White. While he was manning his post, a group of colonists approached him and began hurling insults and threatening him. Eventually, he felt in danger and he lashed out with his bayonet, striking one of the colonists with it. As a result, the angry colonists began to throw stones, ice, snowballs, and all kinds of other stuff at him. Once he began getting attacked heavily, the town's bells started ringing, which is something that would happen oftentimes when there was like a fire. It would let people know there was an emergency. And so naturally, everybody came out into the street and they were like, what the hell is going on? Like, like, what's what's happening when all these, you know, colonists came out of the street, they saw what was going on and a bunch of them rushed over there because they're like, yo, what? What what is going on right now? After he had been defending himself for a little bit, he was being overrun and he called for reinforcements. This is when a Captain Thomas Preston and several other British soldiers arrived on the scene to defend him and the customs house. Once the soldiers showed up, the violence only escalated because the colonists felt more threatened. They became more aggressive and began striking the soldiers with clubs and sticks. And in all the confusion, one of the soldiers fired their rifle, which caused a few more to open fire as well with the belief that they had been instructed to. This resulted in the death deaths of five people and the wounding of six. The five people who lost their lives were guys named Crispus Attux, Patrick Carr, James Caldwell, Samuel Maverick, and Samuel Gray. The soldiers were brought to trial and Captain Preston, along with most of the soldiers, were found not guilty due to claiming that it was from self-defense. Only two soldiers were found guilty and punished. They were found guilty of manslaughter and their punishment was getting brands on their thumbs since they were first defenders and that's based on the current laws at the time. Obviously, like, they're angry because all these taxes and everything like that. And they're like, okay, this is ridiculous. We, we get taxed without any representation over there in England. And they're just like a general level of just tension. There's just a lot of animosity between the colonists and the British and loyalists. And they shot a whole bunch of people, like a bunch of colonists, a bunch of civilians. And that infuriated them when they saw that most of them got off without so much as like a beating. That just kind of escalated things even more. This was all used as propaganda to further propagate the growing anti-British sentiment that was already on the rise. Now, the next nail in the coffin was when Great Britain enacted the Tea Act in 1773. This bill was passed for similar reasons as the Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts, except this is also designed to help bail out the failing East India Company. Now, the East India Company, kind of similar to the, the made-up East India Trading Company of Pirates of the Caribbean. The East India Company was like heavily intertwined with the British royal government's commerce and economic. They brought a lot of money to Britain from the East. What ended up happening is Great Britain saw that they were failing because people were smuggling tea, getting tea imported from all over the world, like Denmark and places like that. Colonists would rather smuggle tea in and not pay a tax for it and sell that. Colonists were already kind of like protesting British goods. So anytime they could buy goods that were made somewhere else or were imported from somewhere else, they would because they didn't want to pay taxes and they were like, I'm not buying any British stuff right now. A way to get around that, the British government essentially undercut 
the smugglers and undercut all the local merchants that were selling tea imported from other areas, giving the East India Company exclusive rights to transport tea directly to America rather than having to go to England first and then come to America afterwards. So they didn't have to pay the taxes that they would normally pay when they would go to England first. They could just come straight here, pay the tax when they got here. They still had to pay the, the, the tea tax, but they didn't have to pay tax twice. So ultimately, they were making a lot more money and they could charge much much lower rates for everything than anyone else could, essentially giving them a monopoly. So like I said, this ended up undercutting everybody else who was selling tea in the colonies and only further served to infuriate colonists and merchants and rally the people to the Sons of Liberty and people that were not big fans of the British government. As a result of the Tea Act on December 16th, 1773, a very sneaky, disciplined group of men dressed like Native Americans boarded the East India Company ships in the harbor of Boston and broke all their containers of tea, dumping around 18,000 British pounds worth of tea into the Boston Harbor in an act of defiance that later became known as the Boston Tea Party. Outraged by the Boston Tea Party and other acts of destruction of British property, the British Parliament enacted the Coercive Acts, also known as the Intolerable Act, in 1774. These acts closed Boston to merchant shipping, established formal British military rule in Massachusetts, made British officials immune to criminal prosecution in America, and also required colonists to quarter British troops. This whole thing was a knee-jerk reaction that the British government had because they're like, we need to put down this rebellion, this divisiveness right now and show them who's boss because if we don't come down hard this is only going to embolden the other colonies to start doing this rebellious type of behavior as well so the intolerable acts consisted of four laws the first law was called the boston port act which authorized the british royal navy to blockade boston harbor because the commerce of his majesty's subjects cannot be safely carried on there this closed the harbor to commercial traffic and also stopped all exports to foreign ports additionally the only imports that were allowed were supplies for the British Army and other necessary goods. What this ended up causing is famine in Boston. And a bunch of people ended up like starving and there was lack of sustenance, lack of supplies because the only supplies that were being allowed in were for the British military. So naturally that's going to piss a bunch of people off too, right? The second law was called the Massachusetts Government Act. This act was under the assumption that the rule of law was breaking down and, quote, in order to preserve the peace and good order of the said province, end quote. Now the Massachusetts Council, which was previously an elected body, became some something that was kind of, they were kind of told what to do by the royal governor, which was an appointed position by the king. Now, this also gave the governor the right to appoint sheriffs and judges without the council having a say. The royally appointed sheriffs could then appoint jurors for court hearings. And also this act only allowed there to be one town meeting a year. This essentially got rid of all representative government in Boston. The third law was called the Act for the Impartial Administration of Justice. This law gave the new royal governor the ability to move any trial they chose to a different colony or to Great Britain itself if it was determined that, quote, an indifferent trial cannot be had within the said province, end quote. Yeah, that's a problem because, like, that kind of goes against the Magna Carta, which allows people to have a trial by jury of their peers. That was a real problem, right? The fourth law of the Intolerable Acts was referred to as the Quartering Act. This is the only act that impacted all of the colonies and not just Massachusetts, because what this law did was it gave high-ranking British military officials the ability to demand better accommodations for their troops and for the accommodations to be paid for by the colonists. There's a lot of speculation that they were able to like just take people's houses and move them in there. I don't know for sure if that was happening. It probably was, let's be honest. I'm sure it was happening at least once in a while here and there. I've also read that they tried to set it up where it was like they were moving into vacant homes homes or vacant buildings and they were using those instead it was probably a little bit of both if i had to, if i had to like take a fair guess at it it's usually a little bit of both of these types of things in any case the intolerable acts were used as a warning sign to the rest of the colonies that they better mind their manners and stay in line or things were going to get ugly as a result of the Intolerable Acts, a group of colonial delegates from across the colonies met in Philadelphia in September of 1774 to voice their grievances about what was going on to the British, and this was referred to as the First Continental Congress. Now, the Continental Congress included men like Samuel Adams, John Adams, George Washington, Patrick Henry, and John Jay. They eventually voted to schedule their next meeting for May of 1775. Little did they know that by that time, they were going to be at war, like full-on war. Now, as the other colonies said, 
sat back and watched these events unfold, Massachusetts raised and led the resistance, forming a shadow revolutionary government and establishing militias to counter the growing British military presence. In April of 1775, Thomas Gage, the British-appointed royal governor of Massachusetts, ordered British troops to march to Concord, Massachusetts to seize a Patriot arms cache. On April 18, 1775, hundreds of British soldiers, about 700 to be exact, marched into Concord to seize the cache. And when the Patriots caught wind of this, they sent Paul Revere and other men mounted on horseback to sound the alarm to the local militiamen. The following day on April 19, 1775, the local militia and the British troops clashed in battle. The saying from the late poet Ralph Waldo Emerson, quote, the shot heard round the world, end quote, was fired at Lexington and Concord. Now, there were some small skirmishes at Lexington and also in Concord, but the weapons cache had mostly been relocated to a different position to prevent it from being taken by the British. And so after they burned what they had found, they began making their way back to Boston. When the roughly 700 British troops started heading back during that period of time where they were trying to find the arms cache and they were trying to like figure out if that was it or if they're like, you know, what to do with it. And they're just destroying stuff and they were getting in little skirmishes here and there around 2000 minute men were slowly filtering into the area and finally got into Concord to meet that group of 700 British. As the 700 British troops started heading on their way back to Boston, full-on guerrilla warfare ensued, which was completely different from the traditional way that wars were waged back in that day and age. Now, the Minutemen were firing at the British from behind trees, walls, houses, all over the place. And it was not like get online and fire. It was like, hey, everybody was just like firing from all different positions behind cover, total guerrilla warfare. The British were not expecting that. And they were pretty much getting routed. So they were like dropping their rifles. They were dropping their kit. They were like taking off so they could move faster. It was not good for them. Once the retreating British troops reached Lexington, there was an entire brigade of British reinforcements waiting for them there, though that wasn't enough. Because by that point, the Minutemen already had the momentum and they were driving. They were driving that train forward, right? They kept attacking the British troops and kept doing this guerrilla warfare and were, were shooting at them from all different directions and attriting their numbers until they pushed them all the way out to Charlestown Neck. By the end of that battle, around 250 British troops had lost their lives and around 90 Patriots had lost theirs. This fight showed the Patriots that they stood an actual fighting chance against the Crown, after all. Because at the time, the British military was like the premier fighting force on planet Earth. And these were a bunch of like ragtag colonists that were just like random dudes, like farmers, people from around the region, guys that owned businesses. Like they were emboldened by this. And they probably gained a lot of confidence that day and during those couple of days because they're like, hey, we might actually have a chance. We got a shot at this. So in January of 1776, Thomas Paine published the political pamphlet Common Sense, which was essentially intended to be distributed to convince colonists to support the idea of American independence. It sold more than 500,000 copies in a few months. 500,000 copies. Bro, Common Sense went viral. That's what happened. Common sense went viral before people even knew what viral was. By the spring of 1776, the desire for independence had gained a massive following. Now, there were many battles that happened after that leading up to July of 1776, but Britain still didn't have any desire to have discussions with the colonists about their demands for reform. Now, eventually, by June of 1776, a five-man committee, including Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert R. Livingston were tasked with writing up a formal statement of what the colonies wanted. Now, this would eventually be referred to as the Declaration of Independence. Thomas Jefferson wrote the majority, like the large majority of it. He kind of relied on Benjamin Franklin and John Adams to give their critiques, to provide any corrections that they saw, so that way they could like revise it before they actually brought it in front of Congress. So after John Adams and Benjamin Franklin did their revisions, they gave it back to Thomas Jefferson, who rewrote the entire thing with the revisions, and then they brought it to Congress by July 4th. Congress revised about one-fifth of it, and then that final copy was what they slapped the table with. The final copy of the Declaration of Independence reads as follows. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should 
should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it, and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate the government governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shewn that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his governors to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his assent should be obtained. And when so suspended, he is utterly neglected to attend them. He has refused to pass other laws for the accommodation of large districts of people, unless those people would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasions on the right of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise. The state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to prevent the population of these states, for that purpose obstructing the laws of for naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriations of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independent and of superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation, for quartering large bodies of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, establishing therein an arbitrary government, and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislatures and declaring themselves invested with power to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, 
burnt our towns and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at this time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy and perfidy scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country, to become the executioners of their friends and brethren, or to fall themselves by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend unwarrantable jurisdiction over us. We have reminded them of the circumstances of our emigration and settlement here. We have appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow these usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity. We must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as free and independent states, they have full power to levy war, conclude peace, contract alliances, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Bro, that is so, that is heavy. That is the heaviest thing that anyone has ever written in the history of the world. If you don't think that that's still important today, no matter what, we've got some other problems then. In any case, the declaration was formally adopted by 12 colonies after minor revisions, and then New York approved it on July 19th. The declaration was then signed on August 2nd. The Revolutionary War continued for five more years at different various locations like Saratoga, the Valley Forge, and the final victory at Yorktown in 1781. In 1783, with the signing of the Treaty of Paris, the United States formally became a free and independent nation. That's how the Declaration of Independence became a founding document to the nation. And that is why we celebrate the 4th of July. Because on the 4th of July, the American colonists declared their independence from the United Kingdom. And we've been independent ever since. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. I hope that you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. I learned something from this. Don't ever forget what July 4th is about. Give me liberty or give me death. Don't ever forget that. Anyway, let me know what you thought about this video in the comments. Let me know if there's any tidbits of knowledge or any cool information about the revolution that you guys think is pertinent that people would love to know about. Put it in the comments. I would love to hear it. We'll see you guys in the next video. Happy Independence Day.